today I'm going to discuss preparing for a drought. My name is Leanne Dillard and I am the Forage Extension Specialist for the state of Alabama. In Alabama, most of us experienced a drought last fall. So why should we care and prepare for a drought now? This has to mainly do with the fact that the better forage management that we do, we reduce the stress on our plants. This makes them more resilient to future droughts and hopefully prevents them from being completely killed in extended droughts. These forage management is going to include proper soil fertility, rotational grazing, and leaving our higher plant residue when we are grazing. Plants that are not regularly stressed will have deeper roots. They make them more able to access water as the water table falls, as well as nutrients, and also have carbohydrate reserves in the roots that will allow them to continue to grow even in unfavorable growing conditions. So obviously, if irrigation is available, this can be a great tool to help us in preparing for a drought. Now typically, irrigation is not economical or even possible in forage or hay fields because of either the, topograph the top topography excuse me, of the field. A lot of our fields are not as flat as row crops, making pivots very difficult, or they're just really expensive. But as you can see in, in this picture, some situations like in a sod based rotation, pivots are available. And this is really useful to help us during a drought. There are other systems called pod systems that are more friendly to non-flat topographies. One example would it be a K-line mini irrigation system. This is a system that we've been doing some research on down in South Alabama that uses a flexible hose line sprinkler developed in New Zealand. As you can see in the video, these pods are basically just that, they're sprinklers, and they're very small and can be moved using an ATV or even a, a truck or some other type of small piece of equipment. They have different costs depending on the pod systems, on how much it would be. They would be really useful for small acreage, really large acreage, say 100 acres or more. You would need to string more pods together, but it could be an option that is a little more economical than pivots. Um, for producers in that situation. Now for most pastures and hay fields, irrigation is not an option for a variety of reasons. So the first thing that we should consider is when we select our species and variety during pasture establishment. There are pros and cons to all forages as there's, there's no golden ticket in the forage world. But if we are concerned about drought, that should be something that we consider when establishing forages. For example, the hay grass has really good drought tolerance. However, its forage quality is lower than that of other warm season perennials like Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass can withstand droughts, but it will have large decreases in yield. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of having the higher quality, higher yielding Bermuda grass compared to the lower quality, lower yielding, but drought tolerant Bahia grass. This is really going to be dependent on your management goals. If you have questions about how you could go through the selection, the pros and cons of each, feel free to reach out to us at Alabama Cooperative Extension. Another example for those of you in North Alabama would be tall fescue. We typically don't have droughts when tall fescue is growing. However, if you are grazing your tall fescue in the summer, like many people in North Alabama do, you will make it more susceptible to drought because it's already stressed because it's so hot. So when we do have a fall drought like we did last year or an extended summer drought like in 2016 that extended into the fall, we actually can see our tall fescue stands die. So this is a time where we have to really weigh our management as well as our species and variety selection. I would say though, when you are establishing forages, all forages, regardless of their drought tolerance, will need water during establishment. So during a drought is not the time to establish any pasture. So proper soil fertility is the first hurdle in making sure that we have a very happy forage stand. Maintaining soil fertility is important and we should soil test every year in hay fields and every two years in pastures to make sure we're maintaining proper fertility. You can submit samples to the AU Soil Testing Lab in, here in Auburn 
and they'll give you recommendations for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium based on the forage species you're growing. For those of you not in the black belt, liming is also very important. This is something that we tend to ignore, but our soils in the coastal plain and Piedmont and mountain areas are very acidic. Adding the extra stress to our forages by having acidic soil will also reduce their ability to perform well during drought scenarios. It also makes certain nutrients unavailable, which means all the fertilizer that you could be applying could be not available to the plant because the soil pH is not, not appropriate. So soil testing is very important. Right now in 2020, we have the, the soil test is only $7 a sample. And I can guarantee you, you'll save much more than $7 by having proper liming and fertility for your plants. So weed management, this is an ongoing struggle for most of Alabama. Unfortunately, in our climate, it's great for growing plants, whether those are plants that we want or we don't want. So just like forages, weeds will develop defense mechanisms to survive droughts. So it's important to control the weeds before the droughts. So during a drought, the weeds are not actively growing. Just like any other plant, they don't have the water they need to be able to grow. Most herbicides, if not all herbicides, require an actively growing plant to be able to have their chemistry perform in the plant. Products are always going to be more effective when used in favorable growing conditions. So if you do have a weed problem, the best method is going to be mechanical control or mowing to clip that back. And then once the weeds are actively growing, you can consider do, using an herbicide. Now, using the correct herbicide is also very important. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free to contact anyone in the, the Cooperative Extension Animal Science and Forage team, and we'd be like, glad to help you. So in my opinion, grazing management is and continues to be the most important management decision and, and use of time that we can have in any of our fields. Now, I use the term grazing management. A lot of these are also going to apply to harvest management and hay. So, um, but I'm going to use the term grazing because we do see a little bit more uh, need for uh, management shifts in grazing. So most pastures in the southeast are continuously grazed. Much like the picture you see here, where you have very little forage available. And this is because in a continuous grazed pasture, cows will over, or any livestock for that matter, will overgraze some areas as you see here, and will undergraze others. They're allowed to select. They have a buffet of options, and they're always going to go for the ice cream and avoid the broccoli. Now, in rotationally grazing, we don't give them the full buffet. We limit them to only part of it. So they're going to be more likely to choose the non-desirable or the less lower quality forages and graze more uniformly. This also allows proper rest compared to continuous grazing because in continuous grazing, because of the overgrazing, most plants are grazed every two days. This doesn't allow them enough time to recover from the grazing of the cows or other livestock. Where in rotationally grazing, the rest period would usually be 15 to 28 days similar to the period of time that we suggest cutting for hay. So we won't want to have our cattle in the pasture continuously. So not only does this prevent overgrazing, but typically we say the roots of a plant are the same height as the above ground biomass. So allowing them to grow taller allows the roots to grow deeper. This is of super importance during a drought because it allows them more access to water. The stronger the roots, the more the plants will be able to access any water that's available. This also increases forage use efficiency. So not only is it making the plant stronger, but it increases our efficiency. So as you can see here in continuous stocking, the animals are going to defecate and waste and trample 30 to 40% of the pasture, which means only 60 to 70% will actually be taken in. In a slow rotation, so they're in a paddock for a week or more, you can increase that all the way to 50 to 60%. In a moderate rotation where we're moving them at least every week, they're gonna consume 60, 70% of that pasture. So we've pretty much doubled at this point the amount of, of grass they're actually gonna be consuming. In strip grazing, which is a very intense management system like where in dairy systems, they may move them twice a day, you're gonna get 70 to 80% utilization. So not only are you increasing your plants 
ability to handle the grazing and reducing the stress, you're actually, of the plants there, able to have a higher grazing efficiency. So it's a twofold reason why this is going to help us deal with drought stress. This has been told to me before, and I believe it wholeheartedly, that the largest return on investment in a livestock system is grazing management. Grazing management, it doesn't matter what your species you're using for your forage or the livestock you're using, by focusing on grazing management, we can increase the efficiency of our system without any changes to anything else. So in a situation where we may have a drought and you've done all the right things, but you still don't have any forages available, we have a couple of options. One would be emergency forages. These would most likely be summer annuals. This again, our droughts are typically July, August, maybe into September. They may go as far as October, but typically that's the scenario we're talking about. So these would be great options. Summer annuals grow really fast. They can be grazable in as little as 45 days. They're high yielding and moderate quality. These include things like sorghum sudan grass, cow pea, pearl millet, and crabgrass. Of these, the most drought tolerant grasses will be pearl millet and crabgrass compared to the sorghums and sorghum sudan grasses. But as I mentioned earlier, they still need rain to establish. So you could not plant these during the drought and expect to have that emergency forage. This would be something we would plant on say five, 10% of your acreage every year and have the option of either harvesting it for baleage or hay if you don't need it or grazing if you do need it. So again, make sure if you want to use emergency forages that you are thinking about establishing them prior to the drought start. So we have been conducting a summer annual variety trial in Clanton for the last couple of years. Now this is by no means saying that the forage uh, varieties here are better than others. These were just the ones I was able to get my hands on um, and seed so that we could plant them. So there's, there's, this is completely, you know, irrespective of that. But I wanted to show you just to give you an idea of some of the yields we're seeing of many of the majorly used summer annuals. So as you can imagine, the sorghum sudan grasses, sorghums and pearl millets have been out the, the best performing grasses that we've seen um, compared to say the brown top and Japanese millets, which are not actually forage millets, but can be used and have been used as forages in the past. Now I will say our crab grasses were kind of moderate in production. I've seen crab grass production much higher than this. Um, and I've seen it much lower as well. Crabgrass tends to be one of those that's kind of a, a little finicky. So um, at this particular project, it did not outperform the millets and sorghum sudan grasses um, as a seasonal yield, but um, they're, they do have quite a variety in yield performance. All of our legumes did pretty well. You can see iron clay, cow pea, lab lab, and sun hemp. Um, I will say that in general, these three are not very grazing tolerant. We harvested these um, with a forage harvester. We did not graze them so that we could measure yield. So I would imagine in a grazing scenario, you're gonna see quite a reduction in forage yield, but you can see here is the potential of, of possible forage yield. So another thing to think about when in a drought scenario is nitrate poisoning. So even if a plant is still growing or still I guess, grazable, not initially growing, um, it can accumulate nitrates. So nitrates um, in the rumen become nitrites, go up into the bloodstream and actually reduce oxygen affinity for red blood cells. And so the animals will asphyxiate from the inside out. So this will happen in drought stress forages where they continue to take up nitrogen, but since they're not actively growing, they store those as nitrates. It's favored when you've had high nitrogen fertilizer applications, which is one reason we don't suggest fertilizing, over fertilizing summer forages, but especially during a drought period. On top of that, if you do fertilize during a drought, the plant's not growing and so it won't be able to access the nitrogen. You can actually test your forages for nitrates. You can send a sample to the AU Soil Forage Testing Lab and we can determine it. Um, if you have forage that sub suspect to having high nitrates, we suggest waiting seven to 10 days after the drought ending rain. 
And this is because during that seven to 10 days, the plant will start to grow again, use up the accumulated nitrates, turn them into protein, and it should no longer be um, of concern. Again, you can do the, the test though, if you are concerned. Now, there are certain plants that can be nitrate accumulators, and I've listed them here. Sorghum corn, Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass hybrids, soybeans, fescue, pearl millet, and Bermuda grass. But in a drought scenario, a lot of times our animals, if they have limited forage resources, will actually consume weeds as well. So it's also important to consider there are certain weeds that are also nitrate accumulators. Our pigweed, smartweed, lamb quarter, Canadian thistle, ragweeds, nightshades, and stinging nettle. Typically things we don't worry about. But in a drought scenario, because the animals are hungry, they could consume these. So something just to keep in mind. So and we've kind of talked about what to deal with with a short-term drought, maybe a month or two where we might be getting a little bit of rainfall, but we're still in a moderate drought. But for those of you, especially in North Alabama, you remember in 2016, we had a six plus month drought. I'm originally from Northwest Georgia. And so I know what my father went through dealing with this drought that seemingly would never end. So in this scenario, we want to make sure we still want to follow what I've said before, knowing that likely we're not going to have any forage to graze. But if we follow what we've mentioned before and on proper management, we're hopefully going to keep the plants from dying during that drought. So in this scenario, we want to, once the forage is consumed, we want to use a sacrifice pen to feed hay and supplement. We don't want to allow them full access to the pasture because this will continually stress the plants and will end up killing the plants and causing you to have to completely do a pasture renovation. If you have limited hay resources, you can limit feed your hay to reduce intake and increase utilization rate so that you're able to kind of divvy out your hay. When the rain returns and the grass turns green, our first instinct is to be able to turn our, our animals out. But once it starts to rain, fertilize and wait. We want the forages to fully recover from the stress of the drought before grazing and harvesting. And this is going to depend on the forage and how much rain, a lot of factors. But even though when the grass turns green, just like in the spring green up, you know, we see it green up and we want to put the cows out there. We want to give it a couple of weeks to grow and de-stress before we add the stress of grazing animals. So hopefully we have, won't have killed the plants during a severe drought. So for more information on any of your forage related questions, please feel free to email us at alabamaforages at auburn.edu. You can also access our website at alabamaforages.com or contact us through Facebook and Twitter. We have a monthly e-newsletter. If you would like to get our monthly e-newsletter to learn more about our forage research, our upcoming um, meetings and, and other information related to forages, email us at alabamaforages at auburn.edu.